Well, then let's start in this case. And it's a great honor and pleasure uh, to have Jan Dreismar as our speaker of the month. And uh, he is now uh, in Switzerland at the University of Bern and has also still some affiliation with the Technical University of Eindhoven. And Jan will tell us about infinite dimensional geometry with symmetry. And we look forward to the talk, Jan. Thanks eh, for accepting. Okay, many thanks, Joachim. Um, many thanks to the invitation to Saga. I think Jose and Joachim and Kathleen and of course the Cyan people are doing a great service to our community. And it's a, it's a pleasure to speak here. Um, so the top, topic of this talk is infinite dimensional algebraic geometry with symmetry. And the idea is that very often uh, problems in applications can be modeled by systems of polynomial equations in many variables. And then once you understand one such algebraic model, you want to increase the dimension by one or by a hundred or something. And you are faced with a similar problem that, uh, that has the same structure as before, but it's more complex because it's higher dimension. Um, then it turns out that you can often put all of these algebraic models into some infinite dimensional limit. And this is very useful if these finite dimensional models have a lot of symmetry, because then this symmetry uh, carries over to the infinite dimensional limit. And it allows you to study this infinite dimensional algebraic structure um, in finite terms, for instance, on a computer. So uh, I would like to tell you mostly something about the algebra that goes into this business and then also a number of applications to um, algebraic statistics, tensor decomposition and algebraic combinatorics. Okay, so let's get started. Here is a very quick recap of finite dimensional algebraic geometry. Um, there we study algebraic varieties, which are closed subsets of C to the N, which are defined by polynomial equations. F1 is zero, F2 is zero, and so on. Now, it turns out, and that's a very classical theorem in uh, algebraic geometry, that, that you only need finitely many equations to describe any algebraic variety, because from some point on, all of these equations are uh, polynomial linear co combinations of the first n of them, capital N of them. And um, so in other words, the ideal generated by all of these equations is equal to the ideal generated by just the first n of them, where of course n can be very large, but it's finite. Now this spaces theorem was made effective by Buchberger's algorithm, who uh, de developed a notion of Gröbner bases for ideals. So you should think of this as a kind of least common multiple of, of the algorithm that computes the greatest common divisor of two polynomials in one variable, and on the other hand of Gaussian elimination. So these Gröbner bases are a little bit like, um, like row reduced forms, but for polynomial equations rather than, uh, than linear equations. And Buchberger's algorithm allow you to do implicitization. So if you're given a polynomial map from C to the N into C to the M uh, by means of M polynomials in N variables, then using Buchberger's algorithm, you can compute the uh, a generating set for all equations that vanish identically, polynomial equations that vanish identically on the image of that map. However, it turns out that um, the image of such a polynomial map is in general not, uh, not a closed subset. Um, so you cannot completely describe it using polynomial equations, but it is always constructible. And constructible means that it's a finite union of sets that you can, each of which you can describe by, uh, by polynomial equations, fj is equal to zero, and certain polynomial disequations hk is not zero. And so the idea is um, we want to see to what extent these, uh, these results in finite dimensional algebraic geometry carry over into the infinite dimensional realm. OK, so in infinite dimensional algebraic geometry, we study algebraic varieties in C to the natural numbers. So now there are countably many coordinates. 
um, defined as before by polynomial equations. F1 is zero, F2 is zero, and so on. Except that now uh, the variables that appear in the first equation may not be identical to the variables appearing in the second equation and so on. Um, so the first equation might be in 10 variables, the second equation in 100 variables, and so on. So this number of variables may, may increase with the system of equations. But each of these single equations are, are just polynomials rather than, say, infinite series or something. Now it's easy to see that sometimes you need infinitely many equations, because if you want to describe just the origin in C to the natural numbers, um, then this is an algebraic variety defined by the equations x1 is zero, x2 is zero, and so on. And obviously you cannot leave out any of these equations. None of these is redundant. However, suppose that you knew in advance that the variety that you're trying to describe um, is preserved by all possible coordinate perm permutations. Uh, then those coordinate permutations would also act on the equations that vanish on the variety. And then it turns out that, again, you need only finitely many equations. In the following sense, um, if you have any ideal of polynomials in this infinite polynomial ring, uh, which is preserved by all possible coordinate permutations, then in fact, um, it is generated by finitely many orbits uh, under this infinite group. So you can write down, say, F1 up to F10, and you take the orbit under this group of each of them that gives you infinite sets. And, uh, and uh, the ideal that they generate is your given ideal. So in our example of the of the origin, you could just write down x1 is equal to zero and you apply all permutations and then you get all other equations for free. Um, right, now, quite recently, uh, Rohit Nakpal and Andrew Snowden classified all sim n preserved subvarieties x in c to the n. And uh, they showed among other things that if X is not the entire space, then every point in X has only finitely many distinct coordinates. And so you can imagine that this classification somehow involves partitions of the natural numbers into finite sets, and it's of a very combinatorial nature. So it's very nice, but it also shows that there are only very few of these uh, sim and preserved closed subsets of C to the N. And in particular, um, I don't know of any algebraic model coming from applications that you can model using these sub varieties. So, it, so it's a very nice classification, but, but it also shows that that is maybe not so useful for, for applications. So the question is, can we do, do we have analogs of Hilbert's theorem, Buchberger's theorem and Chevalier's theorem, and maybe other results? for other infinite groups that act on polynomial rings in infinitely many variables. Okay, so um, here are the, uh, the type of spaces that we will uh, be interested in. So we, we will look at infinite vectors like we had on the previous slide. We will look at infinite by infinite matrices. We will look at infinite by infinite by infinite tensors and so on. And we will also allow multiplicities. So for instance, you could look at the space of four infinite vectors and two infinite by infinite by infinite tensors. Okay, so those will be the spaces that we will look at. And then for this talk, I will restrict to only two types of symmetries, namely the infinite symmetric group that we saw on the previous slide. Um, this acts just on the in in indices of these tensors. Uh, so if you have a permutation pi, then it acts, for instance, on the entry xij of an infinite matrix by acting both uh, by sending it to x pi i pi j. So it acts on all the, on the, all the indices. So if for matrices, this is simultaneous row and column permutations. And for tensors, it's simultaneous slice permutations in all directions. And the other group that we'll look at is bigger than that. And, um, you will see that the more symmetry, the better. So the other group is the infinite general linear group, which is the union of all 
uh, finite dimensional general linear groups. And you can think of this as the, the group of all, all infinite matrices that in the upper left corner are just a finite invertible matrix and then have ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And these act in a natural way on, for instance, matrices by multiplying the matrix from the left with this matrix GI, and then from the right with the transpose of that matrix GI. And there's a similar action uh, via slice operations in all three directions on three-way tensors and so on. So that's how these groups act. And once again, the question is, um, are there analogs of Hilbert's theorem, Buchberger's algorithm, and Chevalier's theorem for these groups acting on these spaces? Now, the rest of this talk will be divided into two parts. The first part concerns uh, finitely many vectors under the infinite symmetric group. And the second part co uh, 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 concerns tensors under the action of GL infinity. Now this infinite uh, symmetric group acts on uh, K infinite vectors. And you can also think of this as the space of K by infinity matrices where the, the infinite symmetric group just permutes the columns. And then dually it acts on the uh, coordinate ring of that space, which is just the space of, um, of, uh, of uh, it, sorry, it's just the, uh, the polynomial ring in variables X, I, J where I, I runs from one to K and J runs through the natural numbers. And the action now is only on the second index because this index I can only take these finitely many values one through K, okay? Well, then there's a theorem uh, that was first found by Daniel Cohen in 1987 in the context of um, varieties of algebraic structures and then later rediscovered by Hiller and Sullivan in the context of algebraic statistics, which says the same thing as the theorem that I had before, for, namely every sim n preserved ideal in this infinite polynomial ring is generated by a finitely many sim n orbits of, of, uh, of, of polynomials. Um, so uh, now there, there turns out to be, so this theorem suffers a little bit from a similar problem as the theorem that I had on a few slides back, there are not so many models that are strictly, that are literally in this space of K by infinite matrices. But there's a kind of philosophy that if you take a, a, a polynomial map from this K by infinite matrices into higher tensor spaces, um, that very often the image of such a map is again defined by finitely many sim and orbits of equations, or at least the closure of the image of that map is. Um, so this, of course, we only allow polynomial maps that, that commute with this action of the, of the symmetric group. And I'll give a few examples of this. So, so here's a very concrete example, which is in fact the first topic in this area that I worked on many years ago. Um, so suppose that you take uh, a matrix A, which is a K by infinite matrix, and you take an infinite row vector B, and you map these to uh, this expression over here. Oh, that's, that's not what I wanted, sorry. You map it to this expression over here. Namely, you take the transpose of A and you multiply it by A, which gives you an infinite by infinite symmetric matrix of rank at most equal to K. And then you add on the diagonal uh, this, uh, uh, this vector B. Now, if A happens to be a real matrix and the entries of B happen to be positive real numbers, then this matrix that you get here is a covariance matrix of infinitely many uh, jointly Gaussian random variables, um, which, which you can explain, which are linear combinations of only K factors plus individual noise whose variances are ca captured by this B. And so if you take the closure of the image of this map, this is called the complexified Gaussian k-factor model. And it was conjectured by Durton, uh, Sturmfels, and Sullivan that the closure of this image is defined by finitely many orbits of equations. And that turns out to be the case. So you see, this is an instance of the ph philosophy that I had over there, where we, have k where we start with k plus one rows, and we go 
uh, in a sin n equivariant way to infinite by infinite matrices. Now I chose this example uh, because it's a little bit easier to describe the map, uh, but a more in interesting theorem that was proved by Hiller and Sullivan is the, the independent set theorem, which concerns, which says that uh, Markov bases for certain hier for hierarchical models where the number of um, um, number of states of some of the random variables in that hierarchical model tend to infinity um, are finite up to the action of this uh, of this infinite symmetric group. And you can again describe this as uh, this model is the image under some equivariant polynomial map from the space of K by infinite matrices is into some space of tensors. And then uh, slightly more generally, whenever you have a monomial map from this space over here into a space of tensors, which is sim n equivariant, then the, then the image is in fact defined uh, by finitely many orbits of equations. And not only that, in fact, its ideal is generated by finitely many polynomials. Okay, there's a lot of further results concerning finite by infinite matrices. Uh, there's beautiful results by Nagel and Römer and all, uh, independently by Crony, uh, Lykin and Snowden, who proved that these ideals have certain natural Hilbert series, series in two variables associated to them. And those Hilbert series are always rational functions. Also, there's a version of Buchberger's algorithm in this setting. Um, which in fact Andries Brouwer and I used to compute explicitly the equations for the complexified Gaussian two-factor model. Uh, so there's a lot of theory, but instead I would like to advertise something that, that is rather new, uh, which is a theorem together with Rob Egermond and Azar Farouk from Eindhoven, which is you start with a sim n preserved subvariety of this k by infinite matrix space, and you project it into C to the K times N by forgetting uh, all but N of the columns of that matrix. And then, uh, then that is a variety XN and it is acted upon by the symmetric group of the first N columns of the matrix. And uh, that action is by, by automorphisms of these varieties. So it also permutes the irreducible components. And the statement is that uh, that the number of orbits on irreducible components is in fact a quasi-polynomial in N when N is sufficiently large. Um, so let me just give a, a very easy example of this. Ah yeah, so a quasi-polynomial is a polynomial except that the coefficients uh, of N to the zero, N to the one, and so on, up to N to the D are not constants, but they are um, uh, they are periodic functions of this natural number n. So a typical quasi-polynomial is this expression that you see down here. It's what, uh, uh, n divided by two rounded downwards is a is a is a degree one quasi-polynomial -poly uh, whose leading coefficient is a half, but its constant coefficient depends on the parity of n. Okay, so let me do the example. Um, if x happens to be defined by xi square minus y, uh, xj square for, for all i and j, then when you take a component of xn on each of these components, every variable is xi is equal to xj or equal to minus xj. Yeah, because this polynomial factors. And uh, that means that the variables are going to be partitioned into two sets where here they are all equal and here they are all equal and minus the value that you had here. And as a consequence, the components correspond bijectively to unordered partitions of the numbers one up to n into two sets. And the number of orbits uh, of the symmetric group on, on such unordered partitions, as you can uh, convince yourself, is equal to n plus n divided by two rounded down. Okay, so that's a very specific instance of it, but there are actually very nice corollaries. So here's, here's one of them, which I like very much. Suppose that you take any finite set of complex numbers and you look at the set of n by n matrices that take values in that finite set and that have rank equal to a given number r. So r is fixed in this story. 
but this little n uh, varies uh, through the natural numbers. And then, then it turns out that if you act on this finite set mn via simultaneous row and column permutations, then uh, the number of orbits is a quasi-polynomial in n for n sufficiently large. Um, so that's something for rank R matrices. And there's a similar analog, uh, analogous statement for, for matroids over, over a given finite field. So, so here the story is you can fix, uh, you, you fix a rank, which is K, um, and you fix a, a field, namely FQ, and you look at any class of rank K matroid representations over this field FQ, where the representations are considered to be the same uh, in, uh, well, in the usual sense of matroid theory. So you're allowed to do a linear, if, if you rep represent your matroid by a matrix, a K by N matrix, then you're allowed to do row, invertible row operations. You're allowed to scale individual columns um, by non-zero numbers, and you're allowed to, uh, to apply a field automorphism. And um, then the statement is that the number, uh, okay, and the condition is that C is closed under deleting, uh, under deletions. And of course, we want to keep the, the matroids uh, of a fixed rank, so rank equal to K, so you're not allowed to delete elements that are co-loops. Um, can I quickly interrupt? Is, yes, uh, so there's from Jordan Eilenberg a question, it's on the previous slide, is the number of components always eventually constant? As here with that number given, giving you the period of the quasi-polynomial. Um, the number of components is a quasi-polynomial in N. I'm not quite sure if I understand the question, sorry. Is oh, the, the, lead, the leading coefficient. Ah, I don't know. Very good. Yeah, I, I, I have not, I, I would, I would be inclined to think so, but I, I don't have a proof of that. No, I don't know whether the leading coefficient is eventually constant. Thanks for the question. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Um, okay, and so then the number of isomorphism classes in C on N elements is a quasi-polynomial when N is sufficiently large. So this is about counting matroids with certain properties. Um, now, this is the bad news is that when, as soon as you go to matrices or higher order tensors, then there's no analog of Hilbert's basis theorem under this infinite symmetric group. It's very easy to write down counterexamples to that. And that means that basically the story ends here for, for the infinite symmetric group. Um, okay, so then I'll move to part two, which is tensor tuples under the infinite general linear group. So here um, we start with uh, a space, which is a direct sum of uh, tensor spaces. So we take n0 numbers on which GL infinity just acts in the trivial way, just by the identity. We take n1 infinite vectors, we take n2 infinite matrices, and so on. And we call this space uh, the space of tensor tuples, or TT. And then, of course, it also acts on the coordinate ring of that space. And I spelled out here what the variables look like, but you don't need to read that. Okay, so this GLN acts on this space and it acts on the coordinate ring. And we ask ourselves, is there an analog of Hilbert's basis theorem and Chevalet, and maybe um, can we do implicitization? Well, there's certainly a weak analog of Hilbert's basis theorem, uh, which says the following. Every GL infinity preserved subvariety of this space of tensor tuples is defined by finitely many GL infinity orbits of polynomial equations. And in fact, if you want to be really pedantic about it, you, you, you can even take a single polynomial equation, take its orbit under, the, under GL infinity, and that defines your uh, GL infinity preserved subvariety. So I think that's quite, quite surprising, but, uh, uh, but that's how it is. Um, so let me give you some, some examples of this to give you a feeling why such a statement might be true. 
So the, the easiest example is the following. Um, if you look at, or the easiest interesting example is the, is the, the space of matrices, infinite by infinite matrices of rank at most k. Yeah, that's a closed subset of C to the n by n. And they are characterized by the fact that all the k plus one times k plus one subdeterminants are identically, are, are equal to zero. And uh, it's, a, it's a small exercise to show that all of these subdeterminants are in fact in the span of one GL infinity orbit um, where, uh, where GL infinity, as I said, acts by, uh, by G and G transposed uh, on the, on, from the left and from the right on the matrix. So that's one, that's, uh, that's one example. Here's a more complicated example. So now we consider three-way tensors. Um, and let's look at tensors that you can describe in this way. So you take an infinite matrix and scalar multiples of it and put them like this as slices of a tensor. And then you take an infinite matrix and scalar multiples of it and take, take those as slices like this of your three-way tensor. And then you end, end, add up these two tensors and you get something that is called uh, of slice rank at most two. Um, and the question is, it turns out this is a closed subset of the, of the variety of three-way tensors. And uh, uh, it turns out that you can de describe it at least set theoretically uh, by the GLN orbits of a cubic polynomial and a sextic polynomial. And as I said, if you want to be pedantic, you can also make one polynomial out, out of it, but you would have to square this cubic and use different variables and add them and add it to this sextic. So it's an, not a very natural thing to do, actually. Now, a consequence of this theorem, which I think is quite interesting and which I hope will be useful for applications is that every such uh, GL infinity preserved subvariety of TT admits a polynomial time randomized or deterministic membership test. And let me explain that by means of these matrices. So if you're given a very big matrix and you want to test whether the rank is at most 10, then uh, of course you can just do Gaussian elimination, which is very efficient. Um, but you can also do the following. You can take your big matrix and multiply it by, by a sufficiently random uh, invertible matrix from the from the from the left and by the transpose of that matrix from the right and then look in the upper left 11 by 11 corner of your matrix if if there the determinant is non zero then you knew for sure that your original matrix had had rank at least 11 but if if that rank uh, if that determinant is equal to zero, then with very high probability, your original matrix had rank at most 10. And so as a consequence of this theorem, every GLN preserved subvariety of TT admits such, such an algorithm. And th this is not just an algorithm that works for infinite tensors, it's, a, it's an algorithm that works for, for large tensors. Um, and if you don't like randomized algorithms, you can just use variables in your, in your matrix that you uh, do the left and right multiplication with, and, uh, and you, get, uh, you still get a polynomial time membership test. Okay, so that was a weak version of Hilbert's basis theorem. Um, now there's also a version of Chevalet's theorem. So that's a, a theorem uh, in joint work with uh, Arthur Bick and Rob Eschermont and Andrew Snowden, um, uh, which we have been in the process of writing down for a long time, but, uh, but, uh, but this part is certainly true, um, which says that if you take any polynomial map from TT to another space of tensor tuples, which commutes with the action of this GL infinity, then the image is always constru constructible. Let me give you an example of, of such a constructible set that is very well known to people who do um, uh, tensor decomposition. So suppose you start with two infinite vectors, V1 and V2, and you cre create a three-way tensor out of those like, uh, like this. You take V1, tensor V1, tensor V1. Uh, so that's just a tensor that at position ijk has the 
i-th entry of v1 times the j-th entry of v1 times the k-th entry of v1. And you do the same thing with v2 and you add those two up. So that gives you a tensor that is said to have rank, tensor rank um, uh, at most two and equal to two when v1 and v2 are linearly independent. And in fact, it has symmetric tensor rank at most two. And to describe the image of this of this map, so it's easy to check that this is uh, that this commutes with the action of the of the infinite general linear group. Um, so it's it's a it's a map that this theorem applies to. And if you want to know the image, well, um, this is uh, these tensors are certainly symmetric because if you permute the tensor factors in the in this description, you get the same uh, the same description. Um, and if you flatten this three-way tensor into an infinite by doubly infinite uh, matrix, then that matrix has rank at most two. That's easy to check. And now those are the equations that hold on the... On, so this is what Buchberger's al algorithm should give you. But, but unfortunately, not everything in the image uh, not everything in, uh, cut out by these equations is, is in the image, because if you take linearly independent vectors V and W, and you form this tensor over here, then it turns out not to be in the image over here. Um, so these tensors, they live in what, uh, what is known as the tangential variety to the, uh, to the uh, order three Veronese embedding. Um, so the fact that this image is not closed is, is well, it's important to people that do uh, tensor decomposition from a practical perspective, because it also means that not all tensors have a best uh, rank two approximation to them. Yeah, the, the tensors that, uh, uh, well, it says that the, the, the set of tensors of rank, sorry, yeah, that the tens set of tensors of rank at most two is not a closed set. Um, let me give an, another example of this, which is more recent. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to give all the details here, but the story here is that if you take homogeneous forms of the Greek two, GI and HI, and you multiply them and take the sum of three of these, uh, then it turns out that the image of this, uh, uh, that of this uh, uh, polynomial map, which goes into the space of homogeneous polynomials or homogeneous infinite series uh, of degree four, uh, that image is not a closed set. And um, uh, Eduardo Balico, Arthur Bick, Alessandro Oneto, and Emanuele Ventura proved that this also implies that if the number of variables is sufficiently large, that the image is not closed. So, so that also that gives another uh, obstacle to, to algorithms for or doing uh, best uh, best approximation by of a, of a, a quartic polynomial by polynomials of this form over here, and interestingly, in their proof, they use this whole machinery of um, of equivariant algebraic geometry. Okay, um, now there's a lot more results. Um, there's a dichotomy theorem uh, in the same ongoing joint work with Andrew Snowden and Egermont and Arthur Bick, which says the following. If you take any point in this space TT and you look at its orbit under the infinite uh, general linear group, then that orbit, th th there are two possibilities. That orbit is either the entire space, or if that is not the case, then it is contained in the image of a GLN equivariant polynomial map from a smaller space, a space, of, yeah, a space of smaller tensor tuples, where smaller is to be understood in a kind of lexicographic way. So, for instance, you're allowed to uh, replace um, a three-way tensor by finitely many matrices, and you're allowed allowed to replace a matrix by finitely many factors. Um, so that this theorem, in a sense, 
explains why, why it is why it is sensible to do tensor decomposition at all. Yeah, a tensor is either as complicated as it gets. Well, okay, an infinite tensor is either as complicated as it gets in the sense that its orbit fills the entire space, the closure of it or of its orbit is everything, or else it can be described by mean of by means of smaller tensors. So I like that result very much. Then there's a uh, a beautiful theorem due to Kastan and Siegler, who use completely different methods from what we do. Um, so let me let me tell you the story here. When you when you have a, a, a homogeneous polynomial of some degree d, then the strength of that polynomial is obtained as follows. You try to write your polynomial of degree d as a sum of products of polynomials of strictly lower degrees. And the number of terms is then going to be, well, the minimal number of terms in such a decomposition is going to be, um, uh, is going to be the strength. And so in this strength, you allow different kinds of decompositions. For instance, if you're looking at quartic polynomials, then you might have terms that, that, uh, that are a quadric times a quadric, but you might also have terms of the form a linear times a cubic polynomial. And what Kastan and Ziegler proved is that um, if you fix a number of variables like 10, then there is a bound um, with the property that if you take, okay, you fix a number of variables, 10, and you fix the degree, say five, then there is a bound uh, such that any homogeneous polynomial of that degree, five, in any number of variables that has strength bigger than this bound specializes to any given polynomial uh, of degree five in 10 variables. Yeah, so, so if you are interested in a kind of small, small kinds of um, tensors or polynomials, uh, then if you look at tensors that are sufficiently big in the sense that they have sufficiently high strength, then such a tensor specializes to any given uh, polynomial in those 10 variables of degree five. And interestingly, their proof uh, first uses finite fields and then uses uh, the machinery of Gower's norms to, to, to go from the finite field case to, to the field, uh, field of complex numbers, for instance. Um, at the moment, we are working on a, on a on a story where we replace this uh, proof using Gower nor Gower's norms by, by techniques that are sort of in the realm of what we are used to so far. Um, and then I already mentioned that uh, the set of uh, polynomials of strength at most k is not closed on the previous slide. Okay, so the slogan I'd like to propose here is that most theorems in finite dimensional uh, affine algebraic geometry have analogs for tensor tuples, GLN analogs for tensor tuples. Um, but there is a lot of open problems still, and I'd like to mention two of those. So the most urgent but extremely difficult open problem is the following one. Is it true that every GLN stable ideal of this polynomial ring is generated by finitely many GLN orbits? So if you go back to my uh, to, to a th uh, the theorem on this slide, then you see that there is a weaker statement here. This just says every variety in TT is defined by finitely many orbits of equations. And, and so if you have studied algebraic geometry, you know that, for instance, the variety uh, defined by x square is equal to the variety defined by x. And, and so in general, in finite dimensional algebraic geometry, you have to to go well to have a bijection between varieties and ideals you have to uh, to use radical ideals and so what this question asks here that's equivalent to this is is it true well okay what we know is that if you take any ideal in this polynomial ring then it's radical no sorry then it what do i want to say just a sec um uh, then it then it is the 
No, if you take any radical ideal in this polynomial ring, then it is the radical of some finitely generated ideal, but we don't know whether the ideal itself is finitely generated. And certainly we don't know that for non-radical ideals. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, a very important open problem, but we have absolutely no idea how to, uh, how to prove or disprove this. Although I should mention that when, uh, when you go only up to matrices, so no higher order tensors, then, uh, then there are uh, results due to Nakpal, uh, Sam, and Snowden, uh, which, which actually prove this. Um, and, and affect a little bit more than this. But, uh, but in this generality, we, we don't know. And then there's a very intriguing uh, computational problem. So suppose I give you one equation or finitely many equations that's equivalent again in, uh, in this polynomial ring over here. And then of course their orbit, the orbit of, the, uh, of these equations define some closed subset of C to the, uh, of this tensor, uh, of this space of tensors TT. And the question is, is there an algorithm that decides whether this variety is irreducible, whether or not it can be written as a union of proper closed sub-varieties? And uh, I don't know whether that is decidable. If it were decidable, then this is in fact the only obstacle to implicitization. Then, then there is an algorithm that takes as input a tensor space TT and a tensor space TT prime and a polynomial map that commutes with the uh, infinite general linear group between them and that that spits out finitely many defining equations, uh, well, equations whose orbit define the image of this polynomial map. But, uh, but, but I have absolutely no idea at present how to test irreducibility. Okay, so uh, my time is almost up. Uh, let me see. I started by recalling some basic uh, finite dimensional algebraic geometry and raised the question to what extent this generalizes to infinite settings uh, where there's a lot of symmetry. We saw that the case of finitely many row vectors acted upon by the symmetric group is very satisfactory because in fact, we have a version of Hilbert's theorem. We have a version of Buchberger's algorithm. Uh, I'm not sure about Chevalet, but I guess that is also true. I haven't, I haven't actually studied it in that setting. Um, so it's very nice, but it stops at finitely many row vectors. So higher order tensors, which, which we see everywhere in applications, um, uh, do not fit into that picture. Now, if you make the group much bigger, you go to GL infinity, then, uh, then we have a very general weak analog of Hilbert spaces theorem. There's an analog of Chevalet's theorem, and we hope there's an analog of implicitization, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so it turns out, so there's a lot of open problems in both of these areas. And if anyone is interesting, interested in working on these or has ideas about these, please let me know. Thank you. Yes, there is actually a question here in this regard. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan. Again from Jordan Ellenberg. The opposite of reduced ideals would be ideals whose radical is the maximal ideal from T1, etc. Do we know a finite generation uh, statement for GLN stable ideals whose set theoretic support is a single point? Uh, GLN stable ideals whose set theoretic support is a single point. I'm not quite, I mean, there's not so many of those. Uh, there's the origin. Um, so as, so as soon as you, as this N zero that I had is, uh, let me, maybe I miss, uh, I don't understand the question yet. If, if this N zero is equal to zero, then the only point in this space over here that is that is preserved under GL infinity is, is the origin. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, then, I mean, that's, that's defined. Okay, that's defined by finitely many uh, orbits. I mean, it's ideal is, is, is generated by finitely. I mean, this is just a, a, 
well, the, the set, okay, maybe I should say this. So, so in certainly in every fixed degree, of course, um, you just have a finite uh, length representation of GLN. So, so in every fixed degree, um, everything is finitely generated. It's only when the degree goes up, it might not be finitely generated. Does that answer your question, Jordan? Huh. You know, afterwards we invite everybody to be on the things and then you can discuss there. <laughs> Please, yeah. So then I would thank you for the talk. Are there any other questions? And uh, Jose, we are uh, probably letting people in now, uh, or uh, how does that work? If somebody wants to join for general chat. Great, so yeah, thanks Jan for the wonderful talk. And then we'll start a informal Q&A and I'll figure out how to, uh, to add again. To people, I forgot it also. Yeah, if you can stick around, Jan. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, fantastic. I'll be here. <laughs> so if you would like to join us for informal discussion, so the attendees still here, uh, just raise your hand. You might have to do it repeatedly and then we'll promote you to panelists and you'll, you'll be able to see yourself in the video. <laughs> 